Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We appreciate you visitors being with us today. Of course, always glad to see our own members. And good to see you in the house of the Lord. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to you. And so you in the radio listen audience, if you'll get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get the broadcast, I believe we can be a blessing to them. Now, if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn, will you please, to Genesis chapter 29, page 43, in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm speaking today on this subject, the man that lived a week with the wrong woman. The man that lived a week with the wrong woman before he got the right one. Now this would be tape number 220. You can get this tape for a gift of $3. If you'd like to have a list of our cassette tape, we'll send you a list of more than 200, and you can choose the ones you'd like to have. And Write in and get them by number or by title. And what we receive in for the tape is used to help defray our radio expense and the purchase of the tape and so forth. So I want you to pray for me and stand by this whole mission work. A lady wrote us the other day and said, Preacher Edwards, my son was saved as a means of listening to the radio broadcast. That always thrills me to hear somebody being saved as a result of listening to the gospel through the broadcast. And you that work with me and stand by me financially, and through your prayers and cooperation, we can reach people for the Lord. We work this together in getting out the gospel. Now, Genesis chapter 29, we have here where a man by the name of Jacob went and visited his uncle, and his uncle had two beautiful daughters, Rachel and Leah. And so Jacob, in serving his uncle, had been watching the sheep, he served seven years to get Rachel. Rachel was very beautiful. And then whenever time came for him to receive Rachel, his father-in-law tricked him and gave him Lear. And then he had to abide with her a week and fulfill her week before he got the right one, Rachel, that he loved. Now I want you to notice verse 17. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Laban said, it is better that I give her. Let's look at verse 18. I'm skipping verse, uh, uh, verse 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel and the same unto him, but a few days for the love he had to her. And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, and I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zelpah, his maid for handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore hast thou beguiled me? And Laban said, it, is, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give this also for the service of which thou shalt serve with thee. And after that, I'll give you Rachel. Now verse 28, And Jacob did so, and fulfill his week, for he gave him Rachel, his daughter, to wife also. And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhar, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he went in unto her, uh, unto, he went in also unto Rachel, he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven other years. Now if you'll read Genesis chapter 34 and verse 41, you'll find there that he served his father-in-law 20 years, seven years before he got Rachel, and then seven years after he got Rachel, and then six years for the sheep 
that his father-in-law gave him. Now I want to bring a message pertaining to this man, Jacob. Now Jacob was a man that had a lot of trouble in his lifetime, and his trouble was with himself. Now if we'll be honest, and we want to see where our trouble is found, nine times out of ten, if we look in the mirror, we can see our biggest problem. As a general rule, we usually have more trouble with ourselves than we do with anyone else. And Jacob was that kind of fellow. He lived a stormy life. He sailed a rough sea. Near he came into the port at evening time. His ship sailed in smoothly. Now if you live a stormy life, may rain in the morning, come up a storm at noon, ere the sun set, the shore should be calm, and of the waves ceasing, and you can sail in smoothly into your home on the other side. Now that's what he did. He lived a very, very stormy life. Many of us live likewise. We live a stormy life. We might not admit it. We have our faults and make our mistakes. We have our blunders as we sojourn like Jacob old did. But when we come to the end of life's journey, we will serve God faithfully and love the Lord we can sail in smoothly. I want you to notice several things about this man that lived a week with the wrong woman before he got the right one. He lived seven days with Leah and then he went on and married Rachel. And of course he had two wives then, Leah and Rachel, but Rachel is the one that he loved with all of his heart and he was, she was the one that he wanted. But this man Jacob here, although he lived a stormy life, he saw the real value of a birthright. Now in biblical times, they had what they called the birthright that came to the elder son. And so he saw the real value of that. Now he had a brother, a twin brother named Esau. Now Esau and Jacob are the first twins that you find mentioned in the word of God. Esau was a hairy man, a hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a man that loved to live in the house around his mother and help about the kitchen and wash the dishes and look after the house. These two men were very different, no doubt about that. And then one day, this man Esau was very, very hungry. And he loved pottage, he loved uh, deer meat, he loved Benson. And he was hungry and he said to Jacob, if you'll make me some pottage and and let me have what I want to eat. I'll give you my birthright. So he did not value that birthright. Now this man Jacob knew the real meaning and the real value of the birthright. Now the birthright simply meant this. To be the one to inherit the birthright meant that he's the head of the family to exercise priestly rights. Number one. Secondly, he's the, the Satan bruiser of Genesis 3.15. That is, the Satan bruiser would come through him. The Satan bruiser of Genesis 3.15 would come through the person that inherited the birthright. And then number three, he'd be in line for the Abrahamic promise of the earth blesser according to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. Now Jacob saw that, he, he appreciated that, and he valued that very highly. That he would inherit these things. And he said to Esau, I'll be glad to do it. I'll fix you a great meal, and you eat the meal, and then I get to birthright, and that was agreement. Now later on, Esau wept because of his mistake, but it's too late. But this man Jacob then inherited the birthright. And though he was gripped with fear about his brother later on, he pleaded with God for the promise of the peace. Now what happened was, whenever Esau realized what he had done, he made this statement. He said, my daddy is an old man. Isaac is a blind man. And one of these days, my father will die. And when my father passes away, I'm going to kill Jacob. I hate Jacob because he stole my birthright. And I'll get rid of him ere my father dies. Now their mother heard that. And she went to Jacob and she said, now Jacob, Esau is very angry. And he said, when Isaac dies, and you know he's quite feeble, and he'll soon be leaving this world, when he dies, he's going to kill you. Now, son, I want you to leave here and go back to my people in my country, back in there, the Chaldees. I want you to go there to my brother, 
Laban. And I want you to remain there until Isaac cools, until the Esau cools off. Because he'll certainly kill you when his daddy dies. And Jacob got his little belongings together and he took off many hundred miles back across the desert, back across the hills to his mother's people back in the area of the Chaldees in that vicinity. And so he left home. And as far as we know, that's the last time he ever saw the face of his mother. Now he had to pay a price and she had to pay a price because of what had happened. She encouraged him to go in and deceive her husband, his father, and steal the birthright in that manner. While Esau was out hunting Vincent, his father told him, said, Esau, you go hunt some Vincent, go hunt a deer, kill it and fix me some good meat, bring it in, and I'm going to restore the birthright upon you. Now Esau, uh, knew what had happened, but probably Isaac did not. And then, of course, we find that Isaac, uh, his wife, Esau's, and uh, Jacob's mother, uh, there she heard what was taking place, that Esau had gone out to kill a deer and fix some venison like his father loved, and then his father would put the blessing on him. And she said to her son, Jacob, your daddy is blind, he can't see you. I want you to go in and pretend that you're Esau. And Jacob said, my father will know better. She said, now wait, I'll fix you up. And so she put on some of Isaac's clothes, uh, J uh, Esau's clothes rather, on, on Jacob. And Jacob said, mom, I'm, I'm a slick man. I don't have hair on my hands and arms like Esau and on my neck. And my father can tell the difference. She said, now wait a minute, son, I'll fix that up. And she took some goat hair, goat skin, and put it around his neck, put it around his hands, around his arms, and he went in there to get the birthright, the blessing from Isaac. When he goes in, then of course Isaac, a blind man, says, Come close, my son, and let me feel of you. And he came close to his father. He said, Well, you feel like uh, Esau, all right, and you smell like him because he's a man of the field. But he said, Your voice sounds like the voice of Jacob. But Isaac, being blind, he thought, Well, I could be mistaken. Come on close, my son. And he brought some Vincent in. His mother had already prepared the Vincent for Jacob to carry in. He carried it in for his father to eat, and his father ate. And his father bestowed the blessing upon Jacob. When Esau came and found out what had happened, he'd had his father's Vincent ready. He went in, and his father said, What is this all about? I've already eaten Vincent. I've already blessed someone. And he found that he had put his blessings upon Jacob. And Esau became very angry. He said, I'll kill him. I'll kill him ere my father dies. I will kill him. And his mother said to Jacob, son, you better flee. I want you to go back to my brother's home in his land. And you remain there until this thing is cooled off. And then we'll see what happens. Now this is the last time he saw his precious mother. This is the last time she saw her son. They both had to pay a price because they had lied and had stolen the birthright. And of course, she was guilty, Jacob was guilty, and it cost them dearly because of what they did. And so he goes then and joins his mother's brother Laban and begins to labor with him. They are keeping the sheep and so forth. And then Laban promised him Rachel. Laban said, now, Jacob, I'm glad you come. Glad to have my nephew here with me. But he said, you're not going to serve me for nothing I'll gladly pay you for what you do. What would you like to have? And of course, um, Jacob said, I'd like to have Rachel. She's a beautiful, beautiful woman. I'm in love with her, and I'd like for her to be my wife. Laban said, all right now, Jacob, if you'll serve me seven years, if you'll watch my sheep and heal my soil and help me for seven years, you'll have her. And Jacob said, I'll gladly do that. And so he uh, began to serve there for seven years, serve Laban. And you know the story, I read it to you. At the end of the seven-year period, when they got ready for the wedding, Laban slipped in Lear. And there the next morning after the wedding, Jacob discovered it was Lear and not Rachel. And he goes to Laban, he said, what have you done? I've served you seven years for Rachel. And the Bible said it seemed like just maybe weeks or days because of love he had for those seven years. And then Laban said, now listen, Jacob, 
Leah is the elder, and it's not the custom in this country to give the younger before the elder, but I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll serve me seven more years, then I'll go ahead and give you Rachel after the week is fulfilled for Leah, and you can have her for your wife. And Jacob said, I will do so. And after a week, after he'd lived a week with the wrong woman, Leah, there he received the right one, Rachel, and then he served him seven more years. But in all, he served Laban 20 years, six years for cattle and sheep, and then 14 years for Rachel. And there he received his wife, the one that he loved. Of course, at this time, he had two wives, Leah and Rachel. But God had placed a blessing upon him. It came in a roundabout way, but he received the blessing. And so he held on and continued on for God, trusting God for God to bless him and use him. He held on for God to God for the blessing in every respect. Now we find in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 26, there a man came down at Jabbok. Now I've been there, I've seen the place where this wrestling match took place. And there was a wrestling match. An angel came down from heaven and began to wrestle with Jacob. Around and around they went, wrestling that Jabbok. And they wrestled about all night. In Genesis chapter 32 and verse 26, the angel said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. He said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Now this man, Jacob, knew something about spiritual matters. He knew the value of God's blessings. And he was wrestling with this angel. He said, Now I want a blessing from you. And unless you give me a special blessing... I'll not let you go. And around and around they wrestled. All night they wrestled. And finally it was about daybreak. And the angel said to Jacob, he said, let me go. It's almost daybreak and I got to get away from here. And Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And the angel said, all right, I'll bless you. And he blessed him. But in doing so, he crippled Jacob and Jacob hopped the rest of his days. He old man Jacob got the blessing all right, but he had to walk away on a walking stick because he was crippled. It cost him something. He paid a price to get that blessing. But the point I want you to see is this. He refused to let that angel go until he received the blessing. The Bible said you shall reap if you faint not. There's many of you in this auditorium as many of you in the radio listening audience, you have prayed for something, and just before you received the answer, you fainted. The Bible said you'll reap if you faint not. Now just keep on praying. Don't let go. Hold on to God until you get what you're praying for. There's some of you have been praying for your husband to be saved maybe for many years. Don't let up now. He's closer to hell right now than he's ever been. And tomorrow he'll be a day closer if he's alive. You must keep on praying that God will save him. Many of you have been praying for your children for a period of time. Don't give up now. They're close to hell right now than they've ever been. Tomorrow some of them might be in hell. Just keep on praying. God may give you the answer before 24 hours. The point I want you to see is this. Don't give up. Don't let up. I've known people that pray for someone for 30 years. I read about a man that prayed for his friends 30 years. And then the man died, the next day his friend is saved. So don't let up. Keep on praying that God saves that husband. Keep on praying that God saves that wife. Keep on praying that God, so God saves those children. Don't give up. When you give up, you may lose what you've been praying for and asking God for a long period of time. Oh, you may say now, Preacher Edwards, is it a sign of the lack of faith uh, whenever I just keep on praying? No, no. It's a sign that you do have faith, that you believe, if you will keep on, that God will come to your rescue. We find in the book of Luke chapter 11, where a man had some company come in on him, and he didn't have enough food to feed his company, but he had a neighbor that lived up on the hill, and he knew his neighbor had some bread in his cupboard. He said, I don't have sufficient food to feed these people that's visiting me. I know where I can find some. I'll go and see my neighbor and get some loaves from him. So he goes to his neighbor's house. He knocks on the door. And the neighbor hollers out, what do you want? He said, uh, I want three loaves of bread. The neighbor said, man, 
why disturb me? I'm in the bed with my children. I don't want to disturb them and get up and get you some bread. Get away from my door. Did the man leave? No, sir. He knocked again. And the neighbor said, man, what do you want? He said, I came for three loaves of bread. He said, man, I ask you to leave. I'm in a bed with my children, and you're disturbing me, and, and you go on your way. I don't want to get up and disturb them. Did the man go? No, sir. He just kept on knocking. And finally, the man on the inside of the house said, the only way I'll get rid of him is to get up and give him what he asked for. Now the man asked for not one loaf. He didn't ask for two loaves. He asked for three loaves. He said, I want three loaves of bread. The man on the inside said, I'll get up. I'll give that man three loaves of bread because that's what he's asking for. If I don't, he'll stay there all night. I'm going to give him the three loaves, get rid of him. Now he got up, he gave the man three loaves, and the man went back to his home and fed his friends. Now Jesus said, when you pray, you ought to pray the same way. Just keep on knocking. Stay on the man's doorsteps. Just stay right there. Don't leave the door. Keep on talking to God. Don't let go. Don't let up until God opens the door and gives you the three loaves. In due time, God will do it. We find in Luke chapter 18, unjust judge. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. He didn't fear women. This woman came to him and began to bother him and said, Advance me of my adversary. He said, I won't do it. And she said, advance me of my adversary. He said, I'm not going to do it. She said, I want you to advance me of my adversary. He said, the only way to get rid of this woman is go ahead and do what she asked. And he advanced her of my adversary. Jesus said, when you pray, you ought to pray the same way. Many of you could have done or had the answer. Done or had the answer and enjoyed the blessings had you not let up, had you not stopped. And you quit praying about it. You say, well... What's the use? Don't seem like I'm going to get anything accomplished. Why keep on praying? That's exactly what the devil wants. The Bible said, you'll reap if you faint not. Don't faint. Keep on asking God. Now this man also made a great vow to God. Jacob did. In Genesis chapter 20 verse 16. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I knew it not. He realized God was there. And in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God would be with me, and would keep me in this way that I go, and would give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and all that thou give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now here is a wise man. He saw the real value and need of tithing. I'm going to say to any born-again believer, I'm not talking now to unsaved people. If you're unsaved, God doesn't want a penny you got. But when you get saved, God expects a tenth of your income. You ought to tithe your income. Wise, saved people do that. Unwise people don't do that, but they pay it anyway later on in some way or another. God's a good collector. And God knows how to collect. He collect in due time and you pay it with interest. But wise people that love God and know God will tithe. They'll love to tithe. They want to tithe. They will tithe because they know the value of it. Know God expects it out of them. It opens the windows of heaven. It pours them out a blessing. And they take care of God's business and God in turn takes care of their business. You ignore God and his business and God ignore you and your business. All right. We find that Jacob saw the value of tithing. Many of us are like the man, the, the wealthy man that aborted a plane for the first time. He didn't like to ride a plane, but he had to go someplace for a business meeting. And he had to ride or else, so he got on that plane. He's very wealthy. And he sat down, and on the way, they hit some turbulence up there. And that old plane began to rock and shake. And there happened to be a preacher sitting behind him. And this uh, wealthy man said, Lord, said, uh, if you'll let me get off this plane safely, I'll give you half of what I owe. Lord, if you'll just let me get my feet on the ground once again, I'll give you half of what I own. And they landed safely. That preacher heard what he said and sitting behind him, and the preacher thought, now I can use some money to get out the gospel, and maybe this fellow kindly help me because he promised God half of what he owned. And so they got off the plane and started walking across the airfield there, and the preacher walked up and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, fellow, said, uh, 
I was sitting behind you on that plane and I heard you tell God if he'd let you get your feet on the ground and land safely, you'd give him half of what you own. And I'm a preacher and I'm trying to get the gospel out and I could very well use some of that if you meant business. He said, I meant business. He said, man, I'll do better than that. He said, after I got my feet on the ground, I promised God if, if I ever put my feet back in, on the inside of a plane, I'll give him everything I got. So people are always trying to figure out a way to get out of their promise and their vows. But God keeps the record. Remember when you promise God something and vow something to God, you need to stand by. And so that man wiggled out. If he ever got on another plane, he'd just give God everything he had because he knew he'd never get on another plane. We need to realize that. Mind this fellow one time, he, he worked in uh, uh, three men in his business. And, and one of the fellows died. He said to his three employees, he said, we ought to uh, give uh, A.B. here a little money. We're going to bury him. And I suggest we give him $25 a piece. They agreed. And so each one went by and laid $25 on A.B.'s chest, then the coffin, and that was $75. And then the man came along on the business, pulled out his checkbook, wrote out a check for $100, laid it in the coffin, picked up the 75 Well, he was doing business, wasn't he? Well, God knows what we can do and what we cannot do, and God expects us to do what we can. If you believe that, say amen. I thank you for both of them. All right, now we need to do what we can to the glory of God. And if you believe it, you're wise. If you don't believe it, you're unwise. Just that simple. Now this man Jacob here went back to Bethel. And Bethel was a place where that God blessed him, where God answered his prayers, where God was real to his heart. And there he went back to get close to God after he'd wandered away. In Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Now to get back into fellowship with God, do what God wanted he had to do, certain things number one he had to put away his false gods genesis chapter 35 and verse 2 number two he had to clean up genesis 35 2 number three he had to remember how god was with him and answered his prayers genesis 35 3 and then he had to bury his old gods genesis 35 4 and then he got on the move and journeyed for god genesis 35 5 and he got back to the family altar in genesis 35 7 now, when Jacob wandered away, he finally came back. But these things he had to do to the glory of God. You know, that old man lived a stormy life. At the end of his journey, he called his children around him. And, and he, he had a, a number of children, 12 sons. He called them to the foot of his bed and began to bless them. The old man lay upon his bed with his walking stick in his hand. He said, boys, I want you to stand around my bed a few minutes. I won't be here very long. I'm going to worship and then go and be with God. We're going to tell you what's going to befall you in the latter years. And he started the oldest to the youngest and told his 12 sons what would happen to them in the latter years. And there he blessed his sons, leaning upon the staff. And the Bible said in Hebrews 11:21, 21, he worshiped, leaning on his staff. After calling his sons around his bed, he told them goodbye, that he'd be leaving them. And then he talked to Pharaoh about the land of Canaan. He said, Pharaoh, you ought to just see that land. And then he wanted to be laid to rest with his fathers. There are several reasons why he wanted to be laid to rest with his fathers. Remember, at this time, he was down in Egypt. Joseph had brought him down in Egypt. But he said, now, when I die, I want you to carry me back to the land of Canaan and bury me with my fathers. He said that for five reasons. Number one, to show his union with Abraham and Isaac in the covenant. That's one reason he wanted to go back. He was united with them in the covenant. Number two, to express his faith in the promise of God, which concerned Canaan and not Egypt. So he was down in Egypt, and God had blessed him and, and told him what would happen in the land of Canaan. Number three, to draw off the minds of his descendants from the continuous in Egypt. His descendants were down there in Egypt. You want to get their minds off of that back toward Canaan. Number four, to signify he would go before them and, as it were, take possession of the land on their behalf said carry me back to the land of Canaan finally to intimate that Canaan was a type of heaven the better country the eternal resting place of all the people of God he said when I die boys don't leave this old man's carcass down here in Egypt I want to worship and then when I put my feet up in the bed and give up the ghost carry me back to Canaan and bury me there with Abraham and Isaac I want to go back and be with them in my barrow and the old man 
blessed his children, leaned upon his staff, and worshipped God, and drawed his feet up in the bed, and gave up the ghost, and went home to join Abraham and Isaac on the other side. They carried his body back to Canaan, great number out of Egypt. Went back to Canaan, buried the old man, mourned for him for 40, year, 40 days, and placed him there beside of Isaac and Abraham, his fathers. He went home to be with God. Jacob lived a stormy life. He had more trouble with old Jake than he had with anybody else. If you'll be honest, you'll find that you have more trouble with yourself than you do with anyone else. Old Jake gave Jacob a lot of trouble and admitted that at the end of life's journey. He told Pharaoh, I've lived a stormy life, haven't lived a great life like my father's before me. And he considered himself as one living a very stormy life ere he journeyed through this world and went on to be with God. If God should call you today, how would it be? Your life may have been stormy, but you can sail safely in. Wouldn't you like to do that? I know you would. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. We know this man that lived a week with the wrong woman, traveled a rough road, lived a stormy life, but ere he sailed into the port, the waves had ceased, and he went in smoothly that sunset to be with thee. God, help us today to be faithful, though the sea may be stormy, the waves may be high, may be rough, it may rain in the morning, storm at noon, ere the sun sets, help us to sail in smoothly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, while Debbie plays for us, listen to me closely. If you're in this building and you want to get saved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to God. If you're backslidden and you want to come back to the Lord, we'll help you back into fellowship. If you want to join this church and we receive members, just come present yourself and we'll take over from there. While she plays and stands and so, if God speaks, you obey the Lord. All I'm asking you to do to obey God, are you looking for a church home? Are you out of fellowship like to get back in? Are you lost and like to be saved? Any other reason I haven't mentioned you'd like to come, would you? While we wait. While she plays another stanza, would you like to join this church and get saved? For any reason, would you like to come? just a moment. Tony and his wife is coming to join the church here at Northside. Anyone else you want to join the church here this morning? We'll help you the way we can if you want to come forward. Make it easy for you as we can. <laughs> 